Good day chaps. Today's video is going to cover one of the more unusual vehicles tested during World War II. It's the Ardeer Aggie, a Churchill tank armed with a 9.5 inch recoilless gun. We'll look at the Ardeer weapons, how they came to be and the fate of them today. The origins of the Ardeer Aggie go back to 1942 with a desire by the Royal Engineers to develop a weapon capable of breaking open concrete fortifications and obstacles. This led to the Churchill AVRE, or Armoured Vehicle Royal Engineers, equipped with a bigot mortar, a munition type with a shaft loaded onto a long pin, or spike, from which the word spigot comes from, originating with spica, or spike in Latin. The Churchill spigot mortar fired a stubby 30 or 40 pound round known as a petard, after the old French word for a bomb, used to close or break up open fortifications and castle gates. The high explosive round, also known as the flying dustbin, a term officially used in the papers due to its shape, flew out to about 100 to 150 metres, where its warhead was fairly effective at cracking open concrete structures. The Avries, along with several other purpose-built vehicles from flamethrowers to bridge layers and arcs, were used for a wide variety of purposes and often attached to Percy Hobart's 79th, also known as the Funnies. But for all its usefulness, there were problems inherent in spigot mortars, and that is the way they were loaded. In order to achieve this, the gun was rotated to face over the bow gunner's position, who would then slide open a modified hatch above his head, and with the gun angled 90 degrees on a hinge, the round was then inserted and the barrel realigned. This meant the system was only effective for one-shot use in most combat situations, without adding unnecessary risk to the crew and weapons during loading, a problem further enhanced by the close proximity to the enemy due to the weapon's very short range. The UK began to look at several options. These included the 6.5-inch Burney and 7.5-inch Jeffries guns, modified ammunition and loading systems, and they also put a tender out to private firms to submit ideas. One of these was picked up in September 1943 by the Imperial Chemical Industries Limited at Billingham in Durham, although the work was carried out at Ardeer in Scotland. This was a logical choice as ICI also made the regular petard rounds. This new weapon was built by themselves along with parts from Allen West & Co Limited and was named the Aggie. The name, an odd one for a weapon, comes from the local bus that shuttled workers to and fro from their housing to the Ardeer factory, and it was famous being rickety and producing great plumes of smoke and cold days, much like the gun, and so the name stuck, although its correct name in the papers is the Ardeer Recoilless Projector. It's also worth pointing out that the name only applies to the gun, not the tank as a whole, and all of the guns discussed are Aggies, much like the Churchill Crocodile, in which the flamethrower is the named part and not the tank as a whole. Several guns were made, although only one would be fitted to a tank, and each was a recoilless gun, not a recoilless rifle as it was a smoothbore weapon. The principle is relatively straightforward and uses Newton's third law of motion. Whenever two objects interact, they exert equal and opposite forces on each other. This would allow such a weapon to be fitted to a lighter chassis and not require the large breech and barrel lining that a regular gun would require to fire such a large calibre. This system worked in a different manner from conventional guns and instead of the charge being detonated and expelled out in a conventional manner with the opposing force of the round being absorbed by the recuperators. With the recoiler system, a blast of gas or a case is ejected out of the back of the weapon to balance out the equation. This normally makes it nearly impossible to mount such a weapon inside a sealed fighting compartment, as the ejected gas and heat would be highly unsuitable. The first of the big Ardeer guns, and by far the largest, was a 14-inch or 355mm gun, which was purely tested as itself with no cradle or mount designed. This weapon fired a 200 weight or roughly 101 kilogram round propelled by black powder. However, this was not remotely adequate as the velocity was only 420 foot per second, and it tumbled in the air, making an accurate strike problematic. Nor was the range any better than that of the petard, and fusing the warhead was at best problematic, and the tube needed cleaning after each shot, 
and so this gun was cancelled fairly on after testing. The next weapons were the 10.5 inch or 266mm guns, and these were extensively tested at several ranges including Shubury Ness, Hankley Common and Sheriff Muir in Scotland. Interestingly enough, if you go to either of these sites, you will find an Atlantic wall out in the woods and the glens. These walls were copied from the intelligence gathered on Hitler's Atlantic wall and rebuilt in the UK to test out various weapons. Each wall was some 11 foot thick at the base of reinforced concrete, often with tank traps and mock-up bunkers, and various devices from the Ardeer weapons to the Churchill Funnies were tested on them in extreme secrecy. The remains can still be seen today, along with the blast damage from the weapons used. Three 10.5 inch systems were made. The first was mounted on a cradle of a modified six pounder gun. And the second was an eight tube system designed to ripple fire rounds and be mounted on a landing craft. However, this latter one did not prove successful due to the harmonization between the guns proving inadequate. While the third was a six barreled version, which was tested extensively. Each round came in a cardboard tube and was aligned with the rear end of the 10 foot barrel on a long cradle extending from the rear and then the front and rear covers of the tube were removed and the round pushed into the barrel by a loading stick sliding out of the cardboard tube. This 123 pound or 55 kilogram round consisted of two parts, a front end, the flying dustbin which included a 60 pound warhead and a 5 pound conical stem with built in cordite charge and the rear section which consisted of a large 58 pound cardboard cylinder with reinforced ribs inside full of sand. Running from the tail and through the tube were two wires trailing out the back. These were then connected to a detonator outside of the gun and fired. The ram would then be projected forwards and the counterbalanced cardboard cylinder fired out the back. The warhead itself went through a few iterations to get the right mix and it was found that using the front one third with 10 pounds of PE2 and the rear two thirds with 23 pounds with a 50-50 mix of RDX and TNT gave the best results, able to blast an eight to 14 foot crater and about two to three foot deep in a reinforced wall, meaning that two to three hits would bring down any wall Fritz might try to put up, once again proving to Nazis that walls don't work. And the whole field gun setup weighed 1.1 tons and could fire two rounds a minute with a crew of four men and a range of four to 500 yards, able to land most shots in a three by three foot area. The next step up for the team was to design a gun that could be mounted in a tank. This proved more difficult to achieve as it had to be loaded inside the turret and took up a lot of space and would require extensive reworks to fit. The 10.5 inch gun would not leave enough room and so it was scaled down to 9.5 inch in diameter and nine foot long. The only tank in service at the time that had the space and the capability for adaption was the Churchill Mark III. And even so, this was at a stretch. The turret was opened up at the front and the back and all but the most essential internal elements were removed. Even so, the gun was still a problem as the rounds had to be ejected out the back and a rear loading mechanism was out of the question and the elevation of the gun was limited to just seven degrees and gun depression to a measly 3.5 degrees to prevent the rear sand barrel from firing into the engine deck. As the idea of the crew getting out of the tank to load it like the wheeled version was out of the question, they instead designed a split tube with a rear sliding chamber. To load the round, the rear of the tube would extend out of the back of the turret and the round placed inside the center of the gun. The tube would then retract and the rear aligned with the back of the turret flush. The round still could not be manually loaded and so a telescopic ramming loading stick was fitted to push the round into the barrel and the cardboard carry tube then extracted. This system, including the tight spaces involved, left the maximum rate of fire at roughly 45 seconds per shot or four rounds in three minutes. The 9.5 inch gun had a velocity of 830 foot per second and fired the 54 pound warhead with 25 pounds of explosive filler and a 45 pound rear sand charge. The high explosive filling was somewhat different, keeping the plastic explosive nose, but a Noble 851E explosive body. The vehicle underwent several tests in 1944 by the Land Assault Wing. 
but it was clear there were problems from the outset. Without going into the minor details, of which there are many such things, like moving wheels, dials and parts here or there, one inch left or right, the primary issue was the large opening at the rear of the turret, which should allow any bullets or fragments into the turret and no solution could be found to overcome this. Other issues raised was that there was no clear way of removing a stoppage or misfire, leaving a smouldering large explosive round trapped inside the turret, which is never welcome. The sand cylinder was also an issue. This would be ejected out of the back to around 33 foot, using air friction and tumbling to spin it into the ground. There is a distinct lip at the back of the barrel to cause this. However, this still led to the problem of a 45 pound lump of burning sand tub hitting somebody in the chops at 800 foot per second. And it was still quite capable of even smashing through light cover and any thin skinned vehicles or buildings in a cone dispersal out of the back end. Any vehicle near the rear end of the tank was going to be covered in an explosive obscuring mist of sand if it was unlucky. ICI suggested anything to the rear could place sandbags around them to reduce this, but it was hardly a sensible consideration. Despite later reports saying the weapon was inaccurate, the firing trials proved otherwise, able to hit an average of 3 foot by 3 foot area with most shots at 400 yards, perfectly adequate for a large wall. The bigger issue raised was that by late 1944, the outcome of the war was almost inevitable. The writing was on the destroyed Atlantic Wall, for Germany at least, and the conversion rate would be far too late to have any noticeable effect. These problems, along with the fact that it offered no major performance over the regular petard mortar, led to discussions held at the Adelphi on the 3rd of October 1944, and the project was officially cancelled. It was thought for a long time that the vehicle had been completely scrapped, but it was recently discovered at least the gun system remains in a private collection and remains all that is left of this curious but doomed project for the largest British wartime gun mounted on a tank. Well guys, that's the end of today's video. If you like that or you want to know more, ask below or give us a like and a subscribe. If you want more engineering vehicles or other types, do let us know below. And until next time, toodle pip.